there can be few questions more fundamental and more human than the drive to understand our cosmic origins. How did a universe composed of just simple atoms and molecules generate a vibrant living world of seemingly infinite complexity? As the search for non-terrestrial life intensifies, it's time now to ask the big question. Just how did life arise in the first place? If we want to understand the processes involved in leading to life here on the Earth, we should probably clarify what we generally mean when we say something is alive. So based on our experiences, we can generally state that all of the life that we've observed to date satisfies the following broad characteristics. Firstly, it is based on chemistry on a fundamental level. It also uses energy from its surroundings in order to maintain itself in a non-equilibrium state. It's adaptive and self-optimizing. It's also made of small individual self-contained units called cells. And finally, that the molecules needed to sustain life require liquid water environments in order to carry out their functions. But of course, all of this is specific to life here on the Earth, and it is quite possible that life elsewhere in the universe could differ in some of these traits. So in an effort to generalize these definitions, the usual standard in astrobiology is that life is a self-sustaining chemical system capable of Darwinian evolution, which is sometimes called the NASA definition. Living systems on Earth are primarily composed of six of the chemical elements. Carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen and oxygen being the most abundant, with smaller amounts of sulfur and phosphorus in addition to trace elements. These elements are combined into long chains of repeating molecular units, with two of the most important being proteins, which play both a structural role as well as regulating chemical reaction rates, and DNA, or deoxyribose nucleic acid, which enables the storage and transmission of information from generation to generation. Now one thing that all of these molecules of life have in common is that their basic structural backbone is made of carbon atoms, albeit this can be in the form of rings or chains or any manner of exceedingly complicated structures, but ultimately all life is carbon-based. And actually there are a number of reasons why carbon is so uniquely suited to being the fundamental element of life, with some of them being that carbon can form up to four bonds with a wide variety of different species of atoms, that the strength of these bonds is great enough in order to ensure stability of carbon compounds, but not too great in order to inhibit chemical reaction rates, and crucially that carbon is just very proficient at forming bonds with itself, enabling the construction of exceedingly complex and complicated molecules. So does this mean that all life in the universe will be carbon-based? Well, people have speculated for quite some time that silicon could be a potential alternative to carbon, since it's effectively a larger version of the carbon atom, which can also form four bonds and indeed bond to itself. The problem though is that silicon interacts with very few other types of atoms, which severely limits the diversity of long molecular chains that you can construct from it. Indeed, it's difficult to imagine how a silicon-based biochemistry could store the amount of information we require to enable Darwinian evolution, and hence even just to call it life. There's also the issue that the temperature range for silicon-based chemistry is just very poorly matched with that of liquid water compared to carbon. So what about water? Why is water so special? Well, at the very least, life needs some kind of medium for molecules to dissolve in and for chemical reactions to take place in. Water has the added advantage of being liquid at temperatures where reaction rates are high, but also crucially that are cool enough to avoid carbon-carbon bonds from breaking. Water can also absorb large quantities of energy without the temperature rising too much, which ensures a stable temperature operating environment for life to conduct its operations. And finally, water is something called a polar molecule. And what I mean by that 
is that one side of the water molecule, namely the side with the two hydrogen atoms, is slightly positively charged, whilst the oxygen side is slightly negatively charged. And this turns out to be vital for the creation of cells, as we'll see in a few moments. And furthermore, of course, water has the added bonus of being plentiful throughout the entire universe. Now, don't get me wrong, it's certainly possible to imagine other potential mediums. For instance, the lakes of the hydrocarbons, methane and ethane, that we've observed on Titan could serve as a potential medium for some kind of exotic type of life. The problem, though, is that at the kind of temperatures that we see on Titan, hovering around minus 180 degrees Celsius, you would require some kind of additional molecule that could speed up the reaction rates in order to enable life to actually function properly on Titan. Another potential medium that's tossed around quite often as the best alternative to water is liquid ammonia, which does indeed satisfy many of the fantastic functions that water is able to provide us, albeit in a somewhat reduced fashion. But despite these tantalising possible alternatives, it does seem that the balance of evidence, at least for the time being, really does seem to favour carbon-based life using water as its functional medium. So now we have an understanding of what life is. There's two questions we need to ask in order to be able to understand its origin. Firstly, where did the building blocks of life come from? And secondly, just how did these building blocks manage to combine and grow in complexity in order to create the first living system? So to answer this, let's turn back the clocks right to the beginning, 13.8 billion years ago, the Big Bang. Shortly after the Big Bang, just three of the chemical elements we're familiar with were produced, hydrogen, helium and lithium. It's from these elements that the first stars formed, generating energy by fusing them together in the nuclear furnace at the heart of their cores. Eventually, this first generation of stars died, exploding violently, enriching the space around them between the stars with new, heavier elements such as carbon, oxygen and magnesium. Over the course of many generations of stars being born, living and dying, the space between the stars gradually became richer and richer with these heavier elements, their concentrations building over time. But it wasn't just the elements that were forged by stars. In the cool outer atmospheres of carbon-rich red giant stars, the environment was just right to enable organic molecules to form. And when these stars reached the end of their lives and threw out their outer envelopes, it enriched the space between the stars with the same kind of carbon-based molecules that we associate with life today. Over time, this mixture of heavy elements and these organic compounds gradually condensed into a molecular cloud, one of which collapsed 4.5 billion years ago to form our own solar system. These primordial organic molecules lingered whilst the Earth formed, held in meteorites and comets, much like Comet 67P, which has been found recently to be rich in organic material. But all of this changed 4 billion years ago, when gravitational interactions between the gas giants sent a cataclysmic wave of asteroids and comets hurtling into the inner solar system, an era we call the Late Heavy Bombardment. Many of these would have impacted the early Earth, seeding it with copious quantities of organic material. So having identified how the building blocks of life likely came to the Earth, what we need to look at now is to try and find a mechanism to assemble them into complex structures capable of self-replication. But there's a small subtlety here known as the second law of thermodynamics. Colloquially speaking, what this states is that an isolated system will always tend to decrease its complexity over time. For instance, imagine you have a house and then you wait long enough, inevitably it will turn to a pile of rubble. But what we need to do to create the first life is the equivalent of taking the rubble and constructing a house. Now, of course, you can take rubble and turn it into a house. The key is 
that the second law allows for complexity to grow over time for a non-isolated system. And by that, I just mean a system where you put energy into it. For instance, this could be in the form of hydrothermal vents on the early Earth. I'll now proceed to describe one plausible scenario for how we can take our non-living simple organic molecules and create the first living cell, a process called abiogenesis. At the end of the day, what we need to build is a simple chemical system of self-replicating molecular chains within enclosed cells that can begin to display the characteristics of Darwinian evolution. So let's start by focusing in on hydrothermal vents, say within geysers on the early Earth. Inside this vent, small organic molecules delivered by comets and meteorites settle onto a layer of clays submerged within liquid water. What this clay surface does is it lowers the amount of energy required for the simple organics to combine with carbon monoxide and hydrogen in order to build progressively longer and more complicated organic molecules. Some of these molecules will be of a type called fatty acids, which have one end which is slightly electrically charged and hence is attracted to the polar water molecules, with another end which is a long hydrocarbon chain which is not charged and hence is not attracted to water. When the geyser erupts, small droplets of liquid water will be sprayed into the air containing these fatty acids. The partially charged end will naturally bury and submerge itself in the interior of the liquid drop, whilst the hydrocarbon chain end will protrude from the drop to the exterior environment because it's repelled out of the water. This naturally creates a barrier, if you will, between the interior, which contains the water, and the outside world, which is what we require to form the first cell. Indeed, the membrane of all cells that make up life today are just made of two layers of these fatty acids arranged end to end, which could have been produced, for instance, by a series of these geyser eruptions. In a similar manner, a molecule called RNA, or ribose nucleic acid, can also grow on the surface of clays submerged in liquid water. RNA is basically a simpler version of the more familiar DNA molecule that simply uses a single strand instead of the two-stranded double helix that DNA uses, though it does also have a few minor chemical differences on top of that. So when the geyser erupted, the droplet would have contained some of these RNA molecules inside of it as well which would have been trapped and locked away in the interior once the fatty acid membrane formed around the outside of our protocell. So what does the RNA actually do? Well, basically it serves the purpose of information storage in these early cells, just as DNA does in our cells in the modern world. And because the raw building blocks of RNA are able to pass through the fatty acid cell membranes, it means that the RNA can continue to grow over time and create more copies of itself. This is somewhat different though from the way that modern life works, which uses a combination of DNA for storing genetic information, RNA for reading DNA and transmitting the information, and finally proteins for regulating reaction rates amongst other functions. In fact, it was long thought to be a huge problem how to create such a complicated system when seemingly all three components relied on each other. But the re really interesting recent discovery has been that RNA is actually able to both store information and regulate its own reaction rates. It's effectively able to do the jobs of DNA and proteins in these early cells. So let's again examine our protocell, which will continue to grow over time with the addition of extra fatty acids to its membrane from the environment. But because the surface area will grow faster than the interior volume with this addition, the cell will necessarily elongate over time until eventually it splits in two, each containing a copy of the contents of the original. And there we have it, a simple chemical system 
that is self-replicating and capable of displaying Darwinian evolution. The first life has been born. So why do our cells use DNA and proteins if RNA is able to do both jobs? Well, ultimately, RNA is just a much more unstable molecule than DNA, and proteins are just much better at regulating reaction rates. So one fateful day, the RNA in our protocell would have aided the synthesis of the first proteins from their amino acid building blocks. And in doing this, it effectively relegated itself to the history books, as natural selection then simply naturally favoured the more specialised combination of DNA and proteins. But bear in mind, everything that I've described to you here is just one possible mechanism for how the first life could have arisen. But the key takeaway is this. It's possible, and indeed has been shown in laboratory experiments, for the basic building blocks of life to grow into more complex structures under very similar conditions than was present on the early Earth. And if we want to look for life beyond the Earth, it's encouraging that these kind of environments and molecules are common throughout the solar system and indeed beyond. Ultimately, we have a good hypothesis for how life began on our home planet. But if we want to test the theory, we have to look upwards and outwards and search for life elsewhere in the universe. And let's say one day we find it, perhaps on Mars or the moons of Jupiter. In that moment, our understanding of the origin of life may never be the same again. Thanks for watching, and if you're interested in learning more about the origin of life and astrobiology, you'll find a number of great references down in the description. This week's feature video is a summary from Caltech of the evidence suggesting a new ninth planet in the outer solar system. Next week, I'll be interviewing Professor Mike Brown, the co-author of the Planet 9 paper, so if you do have any questions you'd like me to ask him, then feel free to drop them down below and subscribe so that you don't miss it.